Welcome to the Astro Guy Podcast. I'm your host, Wayne Zool. The format of this episode is a little different than other episodes, so please let us know if you like it. We're going to go through one of the most innovative astronomy products that's in use today. Astrophotography is a popular sub-hobby in astronomy and has seen great advances in the last several years. When I first attempted astrophotography in the late 1980s, I used a 35mm film camera attached to a telescope that was on an equatorial mount that tracked whatever I was shooting as it moved across the sky. Back then, if the focus was slightly off, all of your images were basically ruined. You also had to guide manually, which meant looking at a star near where you're shooting in a second telescope that's piggybacked on the main scope, then making frequent periodic adjustments to keep that star centered with a hand controller. This was another area where any minor error would ruin an image. Because of these reasons and others, I had abandoned astrophotography for a long time. But in the last 15 years, there's been some major advances in the field. First, DSLRs allowed us to connect a camera to a computer, so this way you could have better control over live focusing and controlling your exposures. Auto guiders came out and soon became affordable. Auto guiders are simply a second camera connected to your guide scope that's connected to a computer that's also connected to your mount. The auto guiding software takes continuous short exposures and makes constant minute changes to the mount to accurately track the stars. Soon after, dedicated astro cams that are sensitive to faint light emitted by nebulae started to come on the market, but all this required a separate computer to run everything, and that in itself has issues such as dealing with temperature, humidity, and power. But in 2018, there was a shift in the field. We'll get to that in a minute. Now, in 2020, I borrowed an astro camera from my local astronomy club. This got me excited about doing astrophotography again. And after starting with a laptop and doing some planetary imaging, I wanted to do deep sky imaging and started going down that route. At first, using free software and a laptop but it was buggy and at times very confusing. That all changed for me when I bought an ASI Air in 2022. Astrophotography requires an investment in time and money, so you want to make sure that you're getting the most bang for your buck. The gear that you use can be expensive. In most cases, the mount, not the telescope used, will determine the quality of your images. Of course, using a quality telescope will help, but a great telescope on a poor mount will likely not produce great images. So start with a good mount that has the weight capacity to more than handle your rig, and then pair it with your scope and camera. Now, telescopes, mounts, cameras, and computers can be pricey items, and they come with lots of issues, such as dealing with power, temperature, humidity, connections, both wired and wirelessly. There's also the worry about the wear and tear on a laptop that you use in the field. Fortunately, now there are several solutions available, but let's go over a very popular solution. There are several mini PCs that are made to be mounted on a telescope, but those are typically based around ASCOM compatible software and control applications like NINA, which while free can be tricky to configure and master. These mini PCs usually require separate power controllers and the units themselves can be expensive. In 2018, camera manufacturer ZWO released the first version of the ASI Air, an all-in-one Raspberry Pi based mini computer that can control all of your gear while managing imaging or video capture, all in a compact, simple device. The ASI Air is one of the most robust yet easy to use tools that can help everyone from beginners to experienced astrophotographers. Not only is the ASI Air extremely full featured, but it's also inexpensive, currently selling for between $199 and $299, depending on which model you go with. In short, the ASI Air, or Air, is really just a mini computer that has software and hardware built into it that can be used to control a variety of astro gear, as well as the software to do image capture, planning, auto guiding, electronically assisted astronomy, and even basic image stacking and processing. With it, you can control many ZWO devices, such as their cameras, focusers, filter wheels, and mounts. 
The Air also supports several models of DSLRs and several other mount manufacturers as well, giving you lots of options. Everything that it does is easily controlled from an app on your phone or tablet. The downside of the Air is that other than mounts and some cameras, you need to use ZWO gear for it to work. By the way, all the Astro photos used in this episode were taken by me using an ASI Air. Stacking and post-processing were done in PixInsight. If you'd be interested in a video about image stacking and processing, leave a comment or send us a note and I'll do an episode about it in the future. The base model of the Air that's available today is the ASI Air Mini. It can be purchased new for $199. This unit has four USB 2.0 ports, four 12-volt power output ports, a 12-volt input port, a Wi-Fi antenna, a DSLR shutter release port, and a USB-C port to connect the Air to your home computer to download files. The Mini is also the smallest and lightest of all the Air models. The ASI Air Plus is slightly larger and heavier than the Mini. It currently sells for $269. Similar to the Mini, it has four user-controlled 12-volt output ports, a single 12-volt input port, USB-C port, and an antenna. Unlike the Mini, the Plus has two USB 2.0 ports and two USB 3.0 ports. And it comes with 32 gigabytes of built-in eMMC storage. The high-end model is the ASI Air Plus 256, which is identical to the Plus, except that it has 256 gigabytes of eMMC memory, eliminating the need for an external flash drive. The Plus 256 is currently selling for $299. Additionally, for the Mini and the Plus, you'll probably want a USB flash drive to store your images and videos, as the onboard memory can fill up quickly especially if you're shooting with a high megapixel camera or you're shooting video. I'll leave a link to the ones that I use in the show notes. They're an inexpensive add-on. Earlier in 2024, ZWO released the ASI 2600 MC Air, which is an all-in-one unit that has an ASI 2600 MC Pro camera, a built-in ASI 220mm guide camera, and an ASI Air 256 built into it. It's also the first ASI Air device to have Bluetooth built into it. If you have a ZWO AM3 or AM5 mount, you can connect it to the 2600 MC Air via Bluetooth. This unit was scheduled to start shipping on September 1st, 2024. I know some beta testers and they've really enjoyed using this device. The best part of this unit is that there are very few wires needed to connect everything, as the Air, the camera, and the guide camera are all connected internally. This unit is selling for $1,999. It's a great value, as the ASI Air 2600 Duo, which doesn't include the built-in ASI Air, but has the same sensors as the 2600 MC Air, and it sells for the same price. There are older versions of the Air, such as the original ASI Air and the Pro, both of which still work, although the original version doesn't support all the current features in the app. Some used units can be found on the market at very reasonable prices. The Pro is very similar to the Plus, but it doesn't have a USB-C port, an external antenna. All versions of the ASI Air, except for the Mini and the ASI 2600 MC Air, have an RJ45 port that you can plug a network cable into that goes to your home router or hub if you want to connect it to your home network. The biggest complaint that I have about the Air is that its Wi-Fi range is spotty. With the Plus, it's supposed to have a range of 20 meters, but if I go more than 10 meters away, the signal drops significantly, and the readout of images is terribly slow. To combat this issue, I connect to my home network via a CAT6 network cable to eliminate connectivity issues. Doing this allows me to easily control the equipment from the comfort of being inside my home. So if you want to use the Air for controlling your gear for astrophotography, you'll be surprised at how easy it is to get started and set up. All versions of the Air come with several 12-volt power cables that you can use to power your camera or other accessories. However, I don't personally recommend using the Air to power your mount or your dew heaters. Although there are people who do it, it can be a draw on the main power supply. Of course, 
you're going to have to get a 12 volt power supply as ZWO does not supply them with the units. I'll leave a link in the show notes for a good power supply. Since ZWO includes USB 2.0 and 3.0 cables with their cameras, focusers, and filter wheels, you should be set for those cables. When I was using a Canon DSLR, I was able to connect the camera directly to one of the USB ports on the air using a USB 2.0 Mini B cable. Some DSLRs require you to use a shuttle release cable in the DSLR port, which will require you to manually set your DSLR to bulb and whatever ISO you're going to use. Connecting your gear to the air is a pretty easy task. Here's how I go about it. Mount your telescope to the mount and add your hardware, the air, your guide scope, guide camera, and if you have an EAF, which is short for electronic autofocuser, or an electronic filter wheel, add those to the setup as well. Make sure that you calculate the backspace if needed and have the right spacers for your camera. Then add in the cables and balance your rig. Depending on which scope or lens that you're using, the setup is going to vary slightly as you may need spacers and other cables. As far as cables go, I first connect the main camera, in my case, a ZWO ASI 533MC Pro with a USB 3.0 cable, which goes to one of the blue USB 3.0 ports. I'll then connect the power output from port 1 to the power input on the camera using the supplied USB cable. I connect the guide camera and EAF to the USB hub on the camera. This leaves me three open USB slots on the air. I put a flash drive on the remaining USB 3.0 port, and then I plug the mount in via an EQ mod cable, and I'll leave a link for that, into one of the USB 2.0 ports. Then I connect the mount to its power supply plug in any dew heaters separately, and lastly, I plug in the power supply to the 12 volt input port on the air. At that point, you can power the air on. In less than 30 seconds, you'll hear a beep. That lets you know that the air's Wi-Fi is up and running. You'll need to download the ASI Air app to your phone or tablet, then launch the app. Now, disconnect from your home network and connect to the ASI Air's network, which is labeled as ASI Air underscore X, 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 with the X's being the name your unit was given at the factory. The default password for this network is 12345678. I suggest changing it. Once your device is connected to the AIRS network, go back to the ASI AIR app and you can start to set things up for an imaging session. If your device asks if you should stay on the AIRS Wi Fi without internet, say yes. This way you'll stay connected to the air during your session. When you set up the air, you'll need to know your coordinates for latitude and longitude. If your device has GPS built into it, you can get it from there, or just use Google Maps to find them. Once you've connected to the air, the app will ask you to confirm several things, your latitude, longitude, and you may need to enter the date and time if the air didn't get it from your device. You'll also need to let the air know which mount you're using. If your mount is not there, select EQ Mod, as long as you're using an EQ Mod compatible mount, of course. You can confirm this with your mount manufacturer. I use a Skywatcher HEQ5 Pro mount, and I have the mount selected as EQ Mod, running at 9600 baud, and it works perfectly. You'll also need to enter your imaging scope focal length. If you're not sure what it is, just enter zero, and the air will attempt to calculate it after it plate solves but we'll get to that shortly. You'll also want to enter the focal length of your guide scope. Then, select your main camera and guide cameras from the drop-down boxes. If you have a ZWO filter wheel or EAF, they should be seen on this screen as well. Once everything is correct, hit the green Enter button. This will now take you to the main user interface screen. The main screen has several buttons. Let's explore them before moving on. On the main preview screen, Click on the Wi-Fi button at the top of the screen. From Wi-Fi, you can see and adjust your Wi-Fi and Ethernet settings. Further down the menu, you get information about live power consumption and CPU temperature, as well as the power control settings for the 12-volt output ports. You can turn each one on or off, and you can even give them custom names. You'll also be able to control the output power percentage, which is useful if you're using the air to power a dew heater. 
Below the power control is the personalize button, where you can adjust the volume of any noises that the air will make, as well as switching between Fahrenheit and Celsius for the temperature readouts. Back on the Wi-Fi screen, below personalize are options to switch device, which you'd need to do if you were running more than one air at a time, which requires multiple rigs. There's also two slide buttons at the bottom to reset or shut down the air from the app. On the menu bar, which is now on the left, let's click the camera button, which is just below the Wi-Fi button. From here, you can select the main camera and turn it on or off. This needs to be done before you can take any pictures. You can also set this up to use your guide scope and camera as the mains if you need to. For example, when I'm shooting with my Samyang 135mm lens, I'll make my guide scope and camera the mains and use that for polar aligning as the guide scope has a smaller field of view. This can also be useful to utilize the focus tools to make sure that your guide scope is properly focused. We'll get to that soon. The next setting is to control the camera's gain. You can also input the focal length of your main scope here as well. Further down are the cooling controls and there are also options here to customize how file names will be created. I find that it's useful to include the object, gain, and temperature in the file name. There's also an advanced settings button at the bottom. I have found the following settings to be useful. I turn on auto white balance on the screen. This way, as images come in and off the air, the colors will look right on your device. I also set it to turn on cooling after the main camera is connected and to turn on anti-do while cooling. I haven't really used mono bin, but continuous preview can be useful if you're manually focusing. Turning that feature on will have the camera take continuous images when you're in preview mode. Doing this with, say, one second exposures will allow you to make an adjustment to the focuser and see the results in almost real time. Okay, now let's go back to the main screen. You do this by clicking to the left of the toolbar where the main image will appear. Now, click on the guide camera button, which is next to the main camera button. From here, it kind of looks like the main camera screen. You'll do the same things. You'll choose the guide cam, turn it on or off, adjust the gain, and enter the guide scope focal length. A little further down, though, things are different. You can adjust the calibration settings for your mount. Again, I suggest checking with the manufacturer as to the recommended settings for auto guiding for your particular mount. You can also tell it to automatically restore the guide calibration from your previous session. This can be troublesome if you move your rig between sessions. I personally keep that setting off. At the bottom of the page is the advanced guiding settings. From this menu, you'll configure your timeout settings and dithering. You can also create a dark library for your guide camera. It only takes a few minutes to run, and you really only need to do it once. You can adjust the guide camera to bin 2, which can be helpful for guiding, and you can also adjust the accuracy of when the air will make a guiding adjustment. The next button is the mount button. Here, you'll configure your mount. There's a green How to Connect button that will guide you through the process if you need it. Below that is View Objects, which lets you choose what objects to go to. But there are other ways to do that, which we'll see in a few minutes. Below that, you'll see your latitude and longitude, as well as your current RA and deck, time zone, and the date and time. You can manually enter the latitude and longitude if you need to, and then press Sync to Mount. Below this, you'll find the centering controls. Go to Auto Center if turned on, will have the air automatically center your object in the field. You can also adjust the time of the centering exposure. Two seconds works well for me. Next is the AMF, or Auto Meridian Flip settings. You can adjust how soon the air should stop tracking before your object hits the meridian, and how long to wait to flip after hitting the meridian. You may need to adjust these depending on if your scope or camera could hit the tripod or mount at some point. I also turn on the recalibrate guiding after AMF. Again, you may not need to, but it works for me. To get back to the mount menu, press the left arrow at the top. Now you can adjust your guiding speed. Again, check with your mount manufacturer for the recommended settings. You can turn tracking on and off from here. You can adjust the tracking rate, which is great if you're doing lunar or solar work. And there's a Go Home button that sends the mount to its home position. The next buttons are for the filter wheel and the EAF. I'm not really familiar with the filter wheel settings, 
as I don't use one, but I do use an EAF. In the EAF menu, you can turn your EAF on and off. If it has a temperature sensor, you can see the ambient temperature. There are autofocus settings, but they're telescope dependent, so I won't go too deep. But you can adjust how often the EAF will refocus. You can do it by temperature change every X hours, when you switch filters, before the start of a target, and after a meridian flip. All of these are user selectable. The next main button is the Files button. From here, you can preview your images, review the logs, and you can even stack images right from your phone. Just be aware that when the air is stacking, it won't perform any other functions. This can be fun while you're waiting for it to get dark, or if there are passing clouds that cause you to pause your session. The last button is the Information button. Clicking that will show you which version of the air you have downloaded. There are some experimental features here that you can use, such as the All Sky Polar Line, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And they have a new plate solving method, although I have not used that feature. You can also use this screen to reset the firmware and report bugs. Okay, that's it for the main control buttons. They're on the top of the screen unless you've clicked on one. Then they'll appear on the left side until you go back to the main menu. In preview mode on the main screen, you'll see several other buttons on the left side of the screen. The histogram button toggles the histogram on and off and lets you make contrast adjustments to the previewed images. The guide button toggles the guiding graph from appearing. I find it useful when imaging to have this visible so I can see if the guiding is going well. The detect button will examine the image on the screen and measure the average size of stars. I find this to be a useful way to see if I need to refocus. This number can also change depending on the local seeing and weather conditions, so you're going to have to be aware of that. The EAF button can be used to manually focus or have the air use your EAF to do an autofocus. When you click this button, you have options to manually focus in fast or slow mode. Just press a button, take an image, and check the focus until you're happy. Or just press the AF symbol, and this will open the autofocus screen. Once it's open, select your exposure time and press the play button. The air will defocus, then make adjustments plotting star sizes until it creates a curve with several points. Then it will make a series of small adjustments near the calculated focus point until the stars are focused. The annotate button will place solve the image and label what you're imaging. Below that is a button to toggle crosshairs on the screen, which can be useful for framing. Okay, we now know what the buttons do. Let's go back to our workflow. Once you get to the main screen, you'll want to set your camera's cooling temperature. I usually image at minus 10 degrees Celsius, but if it's very hot, I'll work at a higher temperature as I don't want to run the fan at more than 80%. But in doing this, I need to make calibration frames at the same temperature. I'll also set the gain for the camera and then go back to the main screen. Now it's time to focus the scope. From the preview menu, use the go to button to find a bright star. Or if you're in the home position and Polaris is in the field of view, that can work well. Okay. If you have an EAF, click the EAF button on the left, then AF, and then the start button, and the air will start the autofocus routine. If you don't have an EAF, you'll want to be able to see stars in a two to five second exposure, at least to start. Now, click from preview to focus mode to do your focusing. Once you're in focus mode, choose your exposure setting. I typically use a bright star and set the exposure between 500 milliseconds and one second. But use what works for you. Once you press the start capture button, the air will begin looping images. If your stars are very far out of focus, try a longer exposure so that you can see the donuts on the screen. If you have an EAF, the focus control on the left will work in this mode to manually focus as well. Let's assume, however, that you don't have an EAF and are just using your scope's focuser to do your focusing. Make a small adjustment to your focuser. The system will need a couple of seconds to refresh, so make sure to account for that. Now, keep making adjustments until the stars appear close to being in focus. Now, using your fingers, move the green box so that one of the stars is centered in it. You don't want to use the brightest star if you can avoid it. 
a dimmer star will often result in a sharper focus. Once you've centered a star in the box, click the zoom button at the upper right and you'll see that star in a box with two different numbers, one for star size and the other for peak value. Now, make small adjustments, waiting for everything to settle after touching the scope. And you'll want to go until the star size is the smallest number that you can get it to and the peak value is the highest. Now you have to realize that the numbers are going to fluctuate slightly due to atmospheric distortion. Once you've gotten it as sharp as you can, press the X to close the zoom window. Whichever method I end up using for focusing, I always double check the focus with a batten off mask, just to be sure. I'll leave a link to where you can buy a batten off mask in the show notes. Once the scope is focused, it's time to polar align. The air has two methods of doing PA. The standard method has the scope in the home position, which is pointing due north at 90 degrees declination. Select an exposure time. I usually use 2-5 to five seconds, depending on which filter I'm using. Then, press the Start button. Now, the air will take an exposure and attempt to plate solve it, which means that it will examine the image and compare it to its database of stars to determine exactly where your scope is pointed. Once it successfully plate solves, which usually only takes a few seconds, click Next and the mount will automatically slew by around 60 degrees in right ascension, and then it will take another image. After the air plate solves that image, the screen will change to a bullseye showing how far you are from perfect polar alignment. However, I personally ignore the bullseye and concentrate on the altitude and azimuth error numbers in the upper right part of the screen. Next, I need to adjust the altitude and azimuth bolts on my mount to bring the two numbers as close to zero as possible. When you're doing this, make sure that you don't adjust the RA or declination axes, as this will completely invalidate your results. I usually start with the altitude axis and make a small adjustment and then hit refresh. After the error solves the image, the numbers will change. If I'm going in the right direction, I'll make another small adjustment and repeat as needed. Once I'm close in altitude, I'll repeat the process, this time only adjusting the azimuth bolts. With my gear, I've found that getting to a total error of 4 arc minutes or less usually results in a good night of guiding. But when I'm using my SCT for imaging, I try to get to within 1 arc minute. But depending on your mount, it can be really tough to get to zero. I've only done it a few times. Once you're within 4 minutes of total error, the face on the upper right portion of the screen will change to a happy face. When you're satisfied, just press Done to stop the alignment. The error will then let you know how your polar alignment compares to other users. If the pole isn't visible from where you image, you can use the All Sky Polar Align, but you need to turn it on in the Information menu. To do an All Sky Polar Alignment, find a spot about 30 degrees from the eastern horizon, but not due east, and start the polar alignment process. Once you press the Start button, the air will take an image, it will plate solve it, and automatically slew about 30 degrees, where it will repeat the process two more times. After the third plate solve, the bullseye will appear, and it's the same process as the standard method now to pull over line, adjusting the altitude and azimuth until you get as close to zero as you can. Again, when you're happy, just press Done to end the polar alignment process. Once polar alignment is complete, Click where it says Polar Alignment and select Preview to go back to Preview Mode. Now, using the Mount button, send the mount back to the home position. Once there, I'll use the Mount Control buttons on the Preview screen to manually slew to any part of the sky. I usually slew to an area near the celestial equator on whichever side of the pier my target is. Then, I'll take a 3-5 to five second exposure and once it downloads, I'll click the Plate Solve button on the left. After the air solves the image, it will show the exact coordinates and give you the option to sync the mount or sync the mount and go to a specific target. I click Sync the Mount. This lets the air know exactly what it's pointing at, and it should be good for the night now. The next step is to set up auto guiding. Click the Guide button on the preview screen, then the graph when it pops up. This brings you to the Guide console. Here you'll set your guide camera's exposure and then click the looping button, which looks like two arrows in a circle. Now click the button below the looping button. This will start the calibration, which can take several minutes. 
During this, the air will make small adjustments to the RA and deck axis to calculate and compensate for the backlash in your mount's gears. Once that's done, you can actually start imaging. But let's go over how to set up a session, since you can do that while the calibration process is happening. Just click the two arrows at the upper left, and it will bring you back to the preview screen. Now the Air has several different methods for image acquisition. I typically use Auto Run, and sometimes I'll use Live Mode, but there are other methods as well. Let's take a look at each of them. From the preview screen, switch to Auto Run. If there's anything there, just clear it. You may need to hit the refresh button at the upper right to do that. Now, click the big plus sign and select Lights. Select from the menu or enter the length, the gain, and the number of exposures to take for the session. In this screen, you can also name the target, choose to group by slot, this is helpful if you're using a filter wheel, and you can choose whether or not to do an AMF if needed. You can also set up a delay for the first image and between images. This is useful if you're not using a cooled camera, as it can allow the sensor to cool a little bit between exposures. Also, you can tell the air to go to the home position when it's done with the sequence, as well as to power down the air when it's done. If you're going to shoot different exposure lengths, you can do that by clicking the plus and adding another field. You can also use this section for taking flats, darks, and bias frames. Hopefully by now the calibration is finished and the mount should be guiding and auto run is set up properly. Now, click on auto run and go back to the preview menu to select your target. You can do that in a variety of ways, such as clicking the magnifying glass in the go to field of the mount control, clicking on the sky atlas at the bottom left and finding your target there and using go to, or if you're imaging something that you've shot on another night, go into the files tab it looks like a flash drive at the top, and go to Image Management. Locate your target and click Go To, and the mount will slew to it. If the framing is different, the air may let you know that you should rotate the field, and it will give you the option to use the Rotate Assist tool. In Preview Mode, take a test frame. I usually go from anywhere between 10 to 30 seconds, depending on the target, and once it's framed how I want, I'll then switch to Auto Run, and click the Start button to begin the session. Another way to do an imaging session is to do live stacking. This method will take images and stack them on the fly while incorporating calibration frames. This is a great tool for public outreach, or EAA, which is electronically assisted astronomy. You'll want to have flats, darks, and biases loaded for this to work well. Select your calibration frames, the exposure time, and the duration of the stack, and press the Start button to start your imaging session. Be aware that in this mode, AMF will not work. If I'm in live mode and I know that my target is going to cross the meridian, I'll wait until about 15 minutes before it hits the meridian, and then I'll switch from live over to auto run. After the air does the auto meridian flip in auto run, I'll wait until everything recalibrates, and then I'll switch out of auto run and go back to live mode to continue stacking. However, the image is now going to be upside down, so it has to be a new stack that you're creating. During any session I do, I use the Detect button to check star sizes every few frames. If the numbers get worse or the stars look soft, you can pause, go to Preview and Refocus, then come back and pick up where you left off in Auto Run. There are other modes for capturing images as well. Plan Mode allows you to image multiple targets in a night, or you can use this for grouping filtered images or making mosaics. Of course, the air will run the plan for you, so you can enjoy a night's sleep as your rig takes the images for you. You can set up your plan while waiting for it to get dark or even connect it to the air during the day, even while it's inside, and create your plan for the night. To set up a plan, switch from preview to plan mode. Click Add to create a new plan. Next, name your plan. Make sure that auto guiding is switched on as well as AMF. Here's where the plan gets fun. You can start the set time if you want. This is great if you know that your first object needs to clear an obstacle like a tree or a house. You can also start the plan manually if you want. Now, set the time that the plan will end. You can also set different options for the end of the plan as well. It can turn off the camera's cooler, send the mount home, set the EAF to zero, and shut the air down. Now, add your targets. Press the plus sign 
and choose your object from the errors database or enter the coordinates. Input the length and number of exposures for your target. Then, when you're done, press the plus sign to add another target and repeat the process until your plan is completed. The app will show the starting and ending times for your plan, but know that these can be inaccurate as the images need to download from the camera and you have to compensate for dithering, autofocusing, and A and F times that aren't calculated here. The Air will also let you know approximately how much space the images will take up. Another method of capture is video mode. This is great for doing lunar, solar, and planetary imaging. You can also use it for lucky imaging of deep sky objects, although that seems like overkill if you're set up for auto guiding. To capture video with the ASI Air, switch from preview to video from the main menu. After centering your target in preview mode, to capture video with the ASI Air, the first thing you want to do is center your target. Then, click where it says preview and now go to video mode. Once in video mode, click the left facing arrow below the record button to open the video controls. There are four settings that you can adjust. From the bottom, you have your exposure in milliseconds. Then above that is the gain adjustment. Above gain are the two white balance adjustments, one for the blue channel and one for the red channel. First, adjust your exposure and gain. I recommend using the histogram as a guide. I usually adjust the exposure and gain until the tail end of the histogram is between half and two-thirds of the way to the right side of the histogram. For me, this provides enough data to produce good results for lunar or planetary videos. On the left of the video screen at the top is a button to toggle the histogram on and off. Below that is the EAF control button. Then, the resolution button, where you can choose from a low of 240p to a high of 1080p. Below that is the crosshair toggle button. Once I have everything the way I want it, I just press the red button on the right to start capturing video. Once I've captured the amount of time that I need to capture, I'll press the same button to stop the recording. So that's my workflow. Now, I've been using the ASI Air since 2022, and it's made the hobby so much simpler and more enjoyable by having a device to control everything with an easy-to-use interface. I no longer need to worry about leaving a laptop outside in the cold or dewy weather, and more importantly, I've been able to produce some nice images that were all taken using the ASI Air. When it comes to astrophotography, I'm my own worst critic, but if nothing else, I'm persistent. I hope that you like the images. So, while all the different pieces of an astrophotography rig can seem daunting, especially to a beginner. The AIRS interface is actually very intuitive and easy to learn and use. Remember when doing astrophotography, having a good solid mount that's capable of auto guiding while robust enough to handle your gear is rule number one, at least in my book. Then, pairing a scope and camera with a guide scope and guide camera, EAF, filters, filter wheels, dew heaters, and whatever other gizmos you want or need to round out your rig. Using the air is a lot of fun. It simplifies many of the processes needed for astrophotography. While it's not the most powerful device out there, it definitely makes for a great tool to start with. If I had a permanent observatory, I would probably use Nina and a PC to control and run everything, as the air can't control a dome or any other brand of astro camera, EAF, or filter wheel. Now, ZWO is growing their line of products, and the air has made it easy to get into the hobby and quickly produce good results. The Air has other features as well, like a mosaic mode and rotate assist. In fact, over the years, ZWO has made many upgrades to the Air, making it even more robust, all while still being as easy as 123. Hopefully, this will help you on your astrophotography journey. Well, that's all for this episode. Thank you so much for joining us, and I hope that you found our time together to be fun and helpful. If you have questions or episode suggestions, please email us at astroguypodcast at gmail.com or leave us a text or voicemail at 973-404-0380. If you're not already a member, please join the Astro Guy Podcast group on Facebook. You can also visit our YouTube channel, the Astro Guy Podcast, for past episodes and other surprises. Please do all of the podcast and YouTube things such as like, subscribe, comment, and share. It really does help. If you'd like to help support the Astro Guy podcast and YouTube channel, you can do that by just buying us a cup of coffee. 
The money is used to maintain and update the equipment that we use to create and publish the show. The link is in the show notes. Thank you again for joining us, and may your skies be clear. As always, Carpe Noctum, seize the night. I'm Wayne Zool, and this was the Astro Guy Podcast. Thank you for listening. As always, your questions, comments, and suggestions are welcome. Keep wondering. Keep your eyes on the sky. Have fun. Carpe Noctum. Seize the night. <laughs>